Last week, Lawrence talked us through what's often known as the prologue of John's Gospel, which is the first 18 verses of chapter 1, kind of introduces the, the, hot, the themes, really, of the whole Gospel in those first 18 verses. It's one of the most amazing and, and well-known passages of Scripture. And today we're going to finish off the rest of chapter 1, so just a small bit. Um, so can you turn in your Bibles to John 1, verse 19? <coughs> And while uh, you're doing that, can I just ask you to put your hand up, and there's no shame in here at all, uh, to put your hand up and be honest if you've ever read the whole of John's Gospel. Okay. And can you put your hand up if you've read it the whole way through more than once? Okay. And can I ask you one more time, can you put your hand up if you've started uh, reading through it or engaging with it in a small group or some other setting over these last few weeks since we've started this new series, just to have a few dressed. Okay, a few people. That's not as many as I'd hoped. <laughs> <laughs> so before I start, can I just please implore you to pick up John's Gospel and to start reading through it in your own time as we preach through it as well. Um, look, even if you did one chapter a week, you'd still finish it before we're going to finish it. Um, so please read it, read it, read through it again. Keep reading it in this season. Um, Leon Morris, who was a New Testament scholar, um, and he wrote a, comment, a commentary on the Gospel of John, he has this great line that the Gospel of John is like a swimming pool. It's shallow enough for a baby to paddle in, and it is deep enough for an elephant to swim in. Um, as in, it is straightforward enough and simple enough that a new believer can pick it up, read through it, and understand the story but it is deep enough um, that those of us who are slightly longer in the tooth um, can, you know, and have read through it many times before, can come back to it again, and we will find deeper layers of meaning and richness and beauty that point us to Jesus. Um, And as I've been rereading it through the last six months or so since we decided to to preach through it, um, I've loved it. There is so much to this, uh, to this gospel. It is simply a great story, and there are stories we get of Jesus that don't appear in the other gospel accounts. Um, but if you spend a little longer with it, if you allow yourself just to stew on things a little bit, you'll find some of that richness and some of that depth. Um, David Ford, who um, has written another commentary on Josh, John's gospel, has this great... Um, line that he uses of lots of John's words of having a deep, plain sense, um, by which he means that there is a plain surface level reading of lots of John's words and phrases um, that you can just get by reading it. And we're going to encounter one of those today. But then for lots of John's words as well, there's a deeper layer of meaning that he is intended that you only get by meditating on his words, by reading it and reading it and reading it again and again and again. And we're barely going to have time to touch any of those things, even if we spend a whole year on it. So if you want to encounter some of that richness, you're going to need to pick it up yourself and be reading through it too. So encouragement over. If you've not started reading John yet, please do. We are going to start off in verse 19. My clicker doesn't seem to be working. There we go. Verse 19, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. And they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. 
I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I've borne witness that this is the Son of God. And the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you'll see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his uh, his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there's no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe. You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Amen. So there's a lot going on here in this passage. Um, We could spend the whole morning just preaching through verse 29 alone. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Or verse 51 where he talks about the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Uh, But what I'm going to talk about this morning is discipleship. Um, Because I believe that John is actually trying to teach us something of the nature of discipleship in this passage. And I think that we can find four facets of discipleship. So first, encountering Jesus. Second, knowing Jesus. Third, following Jesus. And fourthly, witnessing. So let's take a look at that first one, encounter. Each of the characters that we meet in this passage has their own meeting or encounter with Jesus that transforms them and transforms their life. So John the Baptist first encounters Jesus uh, as Jesus comes to him to be baptized. Um, And John the Baptist, by the way, is not the same John who wrote the gospel, two different Johns. Um, We don't get this story of Jesus' baptism in in John's gospel. He just assumes that we're already aware of it. But we do get it in some uh, some of the other gospels, in Mark 1 and in Matthew 3, which is where I'm going to read from. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, but you come to me. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased." So John's first encounter with Jesus, although we don't get it in this gospel, is quite extraordinary. Right? He sees Jesus coming towards him, uh, recognize him, recognizes him, is convinced by Jesus to baptize him. And as Jesus comes out of the water, he sees the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and remaining on Jesus. And he hears a voice from heaven speaking over Jesus. The next day, we get uh, two of John the Baptist's disciples. They encounter him for the first time. One of them's Andrew, the other one is is unnamed, which probably means that it could be John who wrote the gospel, because he doesn't like to name himself in his gospel for whatever reason. Um, And they have their own encounters, and they choose to follow him after they spend the day with Jesus. 
And we then meet Simon, Andrew's brother, who too has his own incredible encounter with Jesus, where Jesus gives him a new name, Cephas or Peter, both of which mean uh, rock. And it's not just, that's not just a random detail. It's like, okay, well, here's why he gets called Peter elsewhere. Um, naming in first century Jewish culture, and in fact, in many cultures around the world today, is, is a hugely important, hugely significant event. Names reveal something of the character of a, of a person or the, the hopes for a character of a person. So we named our oldest, Elijah, uh, which means Yahweh is my God, and my God is Yahweh. We named him Brian, which means strong, virtuous, honorable. We named him Micah, which means who is there like our God. Um, and Rosa May, we, I mean, dis- discount her first name, but her middle name, <laughs> her middle name, Abaya, means uh, God is my father. Um, because we name them that because we have something that we want to be proved true as they grow. We want them, their names to reflect who God has made them to be and to reflect their faith in him that we hope for as they grow older. So names give, uh, give hopes for a character, for a person. So this is a significant moment in Simon's life. Jesus is saying, you are going to be a rock. Um, and finally, we meet Philip and then Nathaniel. And they both, again, have their own meetings with Jesus. Philip follows Jesus and Nathaniel is, is blown away as he meets him for the first time. And it's an obvious point, but to know Jesus, to follow him, and to witness to others about him, we first need to have encountered him. You know, Jesus meets Andrew and Philip personally, but Andrew goes to Simon, Philip goes to Nathaniel. For them to know Jesus, to follow him, to bear witness about him, they, have to, they too have to have had their own personal encounters. And in fact, Nathaniel's really cynical until he meets Jesus himself personally. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is the model for becoming a disciple of Jesus. It's about coming to see for yourself and encountering Jesus personally. Just to be clear, coming here on a Sunday is not the same thing as encountering Jesus personally. So have you encountered him? Have you met him for yourself? So we need to encounter Jesus, but more than encounter is offered more than encounter is needed we need to shift from those who are curious to those who are convinced from those who are acquaintances to those who are lovers and we need to know Jesus and so we come to the first question that's posed in the entire gospel of John which is who are you now this question's asked of John the Baptist but he makes it pretty clear that actually they should be asking it of Jesus and he deflects attention away from himself And so that question of who is Jesus is kind of the leading question for the entire gospel of John. As the story goes on, we get more and more understanding of how to answer that question. But here, in this chapter alone, this one chapter, we get an avalanche, as David Ford puts it, of titles, of names, of statements about Jesus and who he is, one after another after another. And in fact, no other chapter in the entire New Testament has as many uh, titles and names and statements about Jesus as this first chapter in John. So let's just pick them out, and it's going to be a lot, so we're just going to walk through them quickly. Uh, The Lord, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the one on whom the Spirit descends and remains, the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, the Son of God. Rabbi or teacher, Messiah, Chris, <laughs> that's, a spelling, that's a spelling error, uh, Messiah, Christ, anointed one, <laughs> he's got a new name, um, the one of whom Moses and the prophets wrote, a Nazarene, the son of Joseph, the king of Israel, the house of God, that's that uh, angels of God ascending and descending, um, and the son of man. Okay, and that's just in the bit that we read today. If you were to look back at the 18 verses that Nigel read last week, you would probably add the word, God, the one through whom all things were made and without whom nothing was made, the life, the light, the light of men, true light that gives light to everyone, the one who became flesh and dwelt amongst us, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, Jesus Christ, the only God, the one in the bosom of the Father. So in this one chapter, We get all of these names and titles and statements about who 
Jesus is. John is posing this question to us of who is Jesus, and he's immediately giving us a litany of answers um, that reveal more of Jesus, and that will be unpacked, many of them, throughout the rest of the gospel. In fact, even John the Baptist's uh, answers to that question of who are you, his I am not, I am not the Christ, I am not Elijah, I am not the prophet, they parallel Jesus's later famous I am statements, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I am the light of the world, the bread of life, the door of the sheep, the resurrection and the life, and so on. John also says that he is the voice, which can literally be translated as sound, but Jesus is the word. The voice, the sound, lasts only for a little time, but the word, it says in John 1, is eternal. It was there in the beginning. Um, Augustine has this great line when he talks about this these verses. He says, take away the word, the meaning, and what is the voice? Where there is no word, there is only meaningless sound. So John's description of both who he is and who he is not, both point to Jesus, as well as all of the titles and statements and names that we get. So being a disciple of Jesus does not just mean thoughtlessly following some bloke that we met once. It doesn't mean even having a series of encounters or experiences that feel great, but avoid of any meaning or knowledge or understanding. You could encounter me one Sunday, and hopefully you'd come away thinking, oh, lovely guy, really encouraging, very nice, super talkative, definitely not overweight, not even a little bit Amish looking, Um, (laughs) really nice. And you could have an encounter with me every Sunday thereafter, and hopefully they'd be a series of lovely encounters. But you probably would still know very little about me, that is true. You might not know that actually I'm quite shy and a big introvert, that I am a little bit overweight, and that even though I do look a little bit Amish, I look even more stupid without a beard. Um, (laughs) Well, it's silly, but hopefully you get the point. You can have a series of encounters with Jesus that leave you feeling great, that leave you feeling loved and happy, and that he makes you feel safe and comforted and forgiven and free. But actually, you can still know very little about him that is true, other than how he makes you feel. Discipleship has to involve both the heart and the head, right? both the soul and the mind. So who have you understood Jesus to be? Is the Jesus that you think you know, does he match the one that John's revealed to us here in this gospel? And if not, you are invited to ask that question. Jesus, who are you? And he reveal who he truly is. So we're invited to know this Jesus. But equally, it's not just knowing a list of truths about him that we should remember, like remembering a list of facts for an exam. Okay, these descriptions reveal something of Jesus' activity amongst us, his people, and his relationship with the Father and his identity. You know, Jesus is uniquely filled with the Holy Spirit, the one on whom the Spirit descends like a dove and, who, and, and re- remains, abides on him. So he's the one that we look to for our own baptism in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the rabbi, he's the teacher. So he's the one that we go to for wisdom, for how to live our lives. Jesus is the king, the one who rules and who reigns. And so he's the one that we look to for authority and for justice and for protection. He's the lamb, the sacrifice that's offered to God for the sins of the world. And amazingly, he's also the lamb of God, as in he's provided by God. So not only is the lamb that's offered to God for the sacrifice of for the forgiveness of our sins, but he's also the lamb that's provided by God for us. So he's the one that we go to for forgiveness and for reconciliation and for redemption and so on. Right? These are not just truths about Jesus. They're also invitations for us to approach him, invitations to relationship, not just knowing things about him, but actually knowing him. Again, to use another silly uh, example, I can tell you a list of facts about Katie. Born in 1989, she's a teacher, she's brown hair, she's the middle one of three girls. Uh, She lives in Freshbrook, she's my wife. Uh, She's got a birthmark on her left hand. Um, (laughs) What did you all think I was going to say? So you can know a lot of things about her, but that is not the same as actually knowing her. (laughs) (laughs) Get told off of that later. Um, 
So again, ask yourself, do you actually know Jesus? Or do you just know about him? The invitation is there for a deeper relationship. But how do we actually get to know him? How do we accept that invitation to a deeper relationship? How do we move from that acquaintance to that lover? Well, we have to follow him. And this is where we get to the other two hugely important questions in this passage, both from verse 38. So as the first two disciples follow Jesus, he turns and he asks them uh, his first question, not the first question, but Jesus' first question in the entire gospel, which is, what are you seeking? What are you searching for? It's literally, it can mean, what are you desiring? Now, John is completely aware that he's going to have people reading what he's writing. And so this gospel provides interactions, not just between the characters on the page, but also between the story and us, its readers. And he occasionally lets us know that we know a little bit more about the characters in the story and that he gets, gives us a point of view that they can't have, a behind the scenes, if you like. And this is one of those moments. So Jesus asks uh, Jesus asked those questions of the two disciples, but he's also asking the question of us. Right? That's John's intention. What are you searching for? What is it that you are desiring? And you and I need to keep asking ourselves that question. What is it that we desire? Because following Jesus, because discipleship involves an education of desire. When we first choose to follow Jesus, we often desire a what? We often desire something, right? Healing, wholeness, forgiveness, love, community, whatever it is. But as we follow Jesus and as we come to know him, to actually know him more and more deeply, our desires shift from a what to a whom. From a something to a someone. We learn to desire Jesus himself and we learn to desire the things that he desires. And the cool thing is that John actually illustrates this in his gospel. So Jesus' uh, first question, that when we just said, what are you desiring? Uh, Jesus' first question after his resurrection is in the garden um, of Joseph of Arimathea, and he asks it of Mary, and he says to her in chapter 20, verse 15, he says, whom are you seeking? So following Jesus means learning to desire him for his own sake, or as uh, John Mark Comer puts it, I'm just going to plug this book because it is brilliant. Um, it's called Practicing the Way. Um, but jo as John Mark Comer puts it in his brilliant new book, the reward for following Jesus is Jesus. So ask yourself that question this morning. What is it that you desire? Are you desiring a what? Or are you desiring a whom? How long have you been following Jesus? Have your desires shifted in that time? Do you need to redirect them back to him again? So Jesus asked the two disciples that question, and then they ask him, where are you staying? Now that word for staying is quite often translated in the New Testament as abiding. And this is one of those deep, plain sense moments that I talked about at the beginning. Now, the plain sense <clears throat> is that they are literally asking where Jesus was physically staying. The deep sense that John wants us to investigate uh, further is where is Jesus abiding? And if we remember back to Nigel's preach last week in the last verse of the prologue, we hear that Jesus is abiding close to the Father's heart or in the bosom of the Father. It's the literal translation. And incredibly, the invitation both to the two disciples in this story, but also to us is to come and you'll see. Following Jesus is an invitation ultimately into that mutual indwelling of love that exists within the Trinity. Let me just jump forward to John 15 verse 4 and give a few spoilers. So Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire 
and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father's loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. How? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And if that doesn't sound like too much fun, keeping commandments, Jesus' next words, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full or complete. I mean, this is amazing. Isn't it? We are invited to abide in the love, to stay, to dwell, to remain in the love of Jesus. So how do we actually get to know Jesus? By following him. How do we follow him? Where we learn to shift our desires to him and we learn to abide in his love. How do we abide in his love? By keeping his commandments. Which means that we're actually going to have to shift things around in our life, shift our priorities around and things we spend our time doing and things we give our money to in order to learn to abide in his love, just like the disciples did here. You know, in Luke 5, when Jesus, uh, there's another story in in Luke's gospel of Jesus uh, calling disciples to follow him, and it says they left everything and they followed him. We're not just saved from our sin and death, we're also saved to something. We're saved to follow Jesus, saved to practice his way, saved to his kingdom, abide in him and his love, to receive his joy. Am I making sense? So we can't just know things about Jesus, we have to actually know him. And the way we actually get to know him is by following him. And we follow him by learning to desire him and learning to abide in his love. So are you abiding in Jesus this morning? Have you done your equivalent of leaving everything to follow him? Are there things in your life that you've shifted in order to learn to abide in his love? John Mark Homer in his book, again, which I highly recommend, um, asked the question right at the beginning of, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? By which he means that many of us have been taught that being a Christian is agreeing to some, uh, some statements, believing some things to be true, coming to church on a Sunday, maybe joining a small group or giving some of our money. But we're not called to be Christians once in the entire Bible. We're called to be disciples, to follow Jesus. And that requires a personal encounter with him. It requires us to know him. It requires us to follow him. And it requires us to witness Uh, This, by the way, is nearly where the preach ended because I got hooked on traitors. Um, So so it could have been shorter. Um, (laughs) But being a disciple requires us to witness, right? To testify, to evangelize, whatever words you want to use. And we see that time and time again in this passage, right? The first verse that we read today, verse 19, begins with, this is the testimony of John. The very next verse, verse 20, John confesses. That word can can be translated professes or declares. He's witnessing to those uh, who have come asking questions about who he is. And the next day, John sees Jesus for the first time. And again, he witnesses to all of those around him by loudly declaring in a loud voice who Jesus is. And we get verse 32, John bore witness. Verse 34, I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. John the Baptist humbly deflects glory and interest away from himself and instead redirects people's attention to who Jesus is and to what he will do. The next day again, John witnesses to his two disciples so that they actually leave him and they follow Jesus. Simon, uh, Andrew witnesses to his brother, Simon Peter. Again, describing to Simon Peter who Jesus is. And the next day, after Philip follows Jesus, Philip goes and he witnesses to Nathanael. In fact, using almost the exact same words that Jesus uses to Andrew and the unnamed disciple, which is come and see. Being a disciple means to witness to others about this God, this God-man that we have encountered, this love and this joy that we have received. 
we've come to know and to follow and to abide in. As we receive his joy, it overflows to those around us, both in our life and in our words. But more than just an overflow of what we've received, Jesus actually instructs us to witness to others. Matthew 28, after his resurrection, we get the very famous Great Commission, where Jesus uh, is speaking to his disciples, and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, which, by the way, is how we abide in his love. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're to go and make disciples of Jesus, invite people to have a personal encounter with him themselves, to come to know him themselves, to follow him themselves, so that they can be witnesses to others, disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Or Acts 1, Jesus again, before he ascends into heaven, is speaking to his disciples and he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are to be Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth. So one more question. Who are you witnessing to? Who have you told about this incredible love and joy that you have encountered, that you've got dwelling inside of you? Who's your Simon Peter, your Nathaniel, the person you're saying, come and see, come and see for yourself? He'll transform your life. So that we're going to finish in a minute. You'll be thankful to know. Um, there is nothing I've said this morning that is new or original, but I hope that it serves as a, both a provocation uh, to you and an invitation. Um, we are called to discipleship, which means we're called to encounter him personally for ourselves. We're called to know him. Yes, to know truth about him, but also to actually know this Jesus. And we're called to follow him, to imitate and model our life on who he is, to learn to desire him and the things he desires and to abide in his love. And we're called to share with others about him, to invite them to go on this journey for themselves. So we're going to respond. If I could just invite you to stand with me. Um, Susie, are you around? Are you just happy to play on the keys for a minute? If you're here. <clears throat> but if any of those questions that I've asked this morning throughout um, this preach have resonated with you, I'm just going to invite you to respond just by uh, coming to the front um, and we're going to pray for you. Um, so firstly, if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, if you've not yet personally encountered this Jesus that we've been talking about for yourself, can I uh, first invite you just to come to the front? And if there is no one here this morning, that's absolutely fine, because there's going to be plenty of opportunities throughout this gospel to, uh, to ask this same question again and again. And the amazing thing is that Jesus already sees and knows you. You know, we get that story of Nathaniel. Um, just like Nathaniel, we're invited to encounter Jesus for ourselves. But also just like Nathaniel, whom Jesus saw under the fig tree, Jesus has seen us too. Just like Nathaniel, who Jesus knew, behold, this is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Jesus sees us and he knows us. He sees us before we see him. He sees us before the thought of following him has entered our mind. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I can't invite you to come to the front. If you are a follower of Jesus already this morning and you feel you want to encounter Jesus and his glory again, that uh, word that Jocelyn gave to us at the start of the year, of this being a season of encounter and of glory, um, can I invite you to come to the front? as well if you've realised that the Jesus you think you had met isn't the Jesus that's revealed to us in the Bible and you want to actually know the real Jesus or if you've just realised that you have known a whole lot of things about him but you're not sure you actually know him yet can I invite you to come to the front as well
if you want to desire more of Jesus or you want to learn to abide in him and in his love, can I invite you to come to the front? And if you want to be braver in your witness, if you want to um, see more people around you come to him and encounter him for themselves, can I invite you to the front as well? And then I'm just going to pray. brothers and sisters that have responded this morning. Father, whatever their reason for coming to the front, God, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and meet with them now? Would you fill them afresh? God, would you speak to them? Would you provoke them? Would you encourage them? Would you draw them to you? Spirit, we pray, would you do your work this morning and those that have responded. And Father, for each of us here in this room, God, I just pray that as we've um, had this short time together and that they've lent me their ear, Father, I pray that by your Spirit again, you would just do something in each of us as we go from this place. Father, that we would be drawn again to you to turn our desires back to you to follow you, to actually get to know you, the King of kings, the Son of God. Learn to abide in your love. Father, I pray that from each of my brothers and sisters here in this room, God, their joy would be full in you this morning as they go from this place. Their joy would be complete. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We long to know you more to live our lives for your glory, to give ourselves for you as you have given yourself for us. So lead us, I pray, and fill us with your love.